Good afternoon. My name is Mathieu Rouault. You can see from my accent I'm French, but I've been in South Africa now for 20 years. I went to South Africa at the end of the apartheid because I was curious about that country, and also I wanted to surf the good waves of, that, of, that, uh, of South Africa. But what made me stay in South Africa, in spite of also the interesting political life, is the importance of the ocean on the weather, climate, and marine ecosystem of, of South Africa. And uh, the important scientific questions that can be applied to the benefit of society. So this is where I live. In Cape Town, this is the Cape Peninsula. The water is very cold here, up to 10 degrees, down to 10 degrees. You're not going to swim nicely there. If you want to find warm water, unfortunately, you have to go south, 200 kilometers, 300 kilometers, where the water is 24 degrees, 23 degrees, in spite of being almost at, at 40 south here. This is the Agulhas current. The white line here are clouds. That satellite doesn't see through clouds, but it has a very nice uh, resolution. And what you can see here, those big blobs of water called eddies, they are what's called the leakage of Indian Ocean water into the Atlantic. Eventually, they will make their way to Brazil, and eventually, they will make their way to the North Atlantic. And it's one of the reasons I've been invited here. Some drastic changes have happened in the Agulhas current, and some uh, colleagues uh, have put forward the idea that the Agulhas current was very important to the climate of the North Atlantic. The big fear for you and for Europe, the Northern Europe, is that they, it will freeze. And they made a, a movie the day after tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, as we will see, there is a chance that done in Africa, we're going to maybe help you guys not to free, freeze you to death. So the Agulhas current, the, warm, the cold water of the upwelling, we have also a very nice setup there with very strong wind leading to an upwelling of, of cold water full of nutrients. And we have a, a big fishery there, one of the most uh, productive fisheries in the world. Um, the Agulhas current is following the, the continental shelf here. And here, it's creating also an upwelling itself. It's that cold water here is actually created by the motion of the Agulhas current. We will see that this detail uh, has an importance. Now, the Agulhas current is part of the western boundary family of current. The Gulf Stream, the Kurushio are, are well known, the Agulhas less. A particularity of the Agulhas current that you can see here, the current from altimetry. This is the average current derived from altimetry. And the mean sea surface temperature average over uh, 88206. Basically, you can see that it's turning back onto itself meandering here, this is called the retroflexion area. And this is called the Agulhas return current. So most of, of the water is actually flowing back into the Indian Ocean. And only maybe 10 to 15% of that water is leaking through those eddies. Of course, the average is taking out all those nice eddies. Here is another example of the retroflexion of the Agulhas current. This time, the satellite can see through the clouds, which is very important, especially uh, due to the... Uh, yeah. And you can see here, this is basically every week, an average of every week in 2001, a very nice retroflexion of the Agulhas current. That's uh, first week, second week, third week, fourth week, fifth, and the sixth week. What you can see here is actually it's very difficult to cool the Agulhas current, 24 degrees, for almost a, a month, more than a month, and even going far south where you have very strong wind and cold air that should have cooled the ocean. The Agulhas current doesn't move. The sea surface temperature doesn't move. It's because it's actually extremely uh, deep and, and hot. And that's also some importance in the rest of the story. 
So the Hagelas currents force the atmosphere, not the other way around. Uh, this is a very strange thing in the Hagelas current. This is called an early retroflexion. Usually, the retroflexion, the turning, uh, occurs in that region. But for six, six months, this is just uh, six weeks, but for six months that year, the Hagelas current didn't communicate anymore with the Atlantic Ocean. It was, sh it, it was shut down from the Atlantic. There was no eddies. And actually, some of the theory uh, that actually I'm against <laughs> is that when you have a very strong Agulhas current, there is less leakage of warm water. This seems to be the case for those six months. But early retroflexion, we only had three the last 30 years. This is from Lisa Bill's website. She was a Harry uh, PhD student. I think she did a cruise she organized in the Agulhas current. You can see uh, it's a bit blurred, but this is the velocity of the current. And basically, uh, this is about one meter per second, 50 centimeter per second. This is, this is quite a lot. I think uh, it's about the current can be, for people sailing, that current can be up to four to five knots. And uh, the core of the current is about 100 kilometers wide. You can imagine how powerful it is. But you can see here, it's actually basically 2,000, 3,000 meters, I think, here as well. So it's very deep. And it's very warm, and it's very powerful. <laughs> the origin of the Agulhas current. This is part of the subtropical gyre. And origin of the Agulhas current are Mozambique Channel eddies. Also, in the Mozambique Channel, there is no such a thing as a Mozambique current. It was altimetry that allows us to discover that it was populated by big, large eddies that are formed here. And they, they go down the channel and feed the current. We have also uh, some eddies coming from south of Madagascar. You have the south equatorial current, then the east Madagascar current. And here, that flow can also form some big eddies. And then you have the general uh, gyre circulation that also brings a lot of water to the coast where it's piling up. Uh, you will not find this current in books. We believe that we have found a current with Gerold Ziedler. Gerold Ziedler, he was 75 when he visited us in Cape Town, and he was a seagoing oceanographer. Uh, he is an incredible scientist. He's actually my, my, my model. And uh, 75, still doing some research arrived in Cape Town, and he knew I was using current from altimetry. It was a new product. It, there was a Rio uh, and Hernandez paper. And I was starting to use those current and even put them in real time on a website for the benefit of society. And when he looked at those currents that I was doing on the Atlantic, he told me, listen, my research question is to find if there are some recirculation in the south of Madagascar. I want to see a current here. So I just, with my MATLAB soft software, averaged the current from uh, Aviso, and what happened is that feature. This is how you discover a current, by chance. <laughs> this is the beauty of working in South Africa. There are so few people interested working in that region that you will find things all the time. Well, we believe it's a current, so what Gerald did was actually to take some section from crews uh, from the war station. So you can see only three crews that he could use over the last 30 years or, or so. I think it's not much. So yeah, but you, the caveat here is you have to average the data for about six months before that feature occurs. And then it seems there is, like the Agulhas current, a bit of a retroflexion here. But this could be an artifact of the averaging. Anyway, I couldn't help myself to uh, brag about our discovery. <laughs> but this is now changing the way people are looking at the Indian Ocean, where exchange of heat is supposed to be north-south. This is now quite a big current going, a counter current going in that direction. Now the, the talk is going to talk about this warming. So basically, here 
it's just also a linear trend of satellite remote sensing uh, estimated sea surface temperature from 85 to 207. That was from the Pathfinder data set. And uh, basically, I do a linear trend. It's basically for each point, I try to, to fit a, a slope, uh, a straight line into the point and calculate the, the slope of that uh, straight line. This is a linear trend. And I superimpose here the mean current from the Agulhas current. So what can I see here and what can we see here? Well, I'll talk about all of that later. Because there is one other aspect of the Agulhas current that is not well known and that has an impact on local weather and climate and maybe on, on global weather. It's actually that western boundary current always lose energy. And uh, here, this is the net heat budget as, a, as the sea surface temperature. You can see that well known that ocean gain energy along the equator. But western boundary current lose a lot of energy. And it's basically due to very strong latent, turbulent latent heat flux that here, up to 200 watt per square meter on average. What is the latent heat flux, turbulent latent heat flux? It is evaporation and turbulent mixing at the surface of the ocean. This is the beginning of the water cycle. This is also a very efficient way of cooling the ocean that's a bit underrated. But the interesting part of it is that if there is a warming of the Agulhas current and if there is an increase in the latent heat flux, that latent heat flux, it's actually called the latent heat flux because it's cooling the ocean, but that heat, when it rains, will be released into the atmosphere. So that could actually also warm the atmosphere. So there is a cooling of the ocean all year long, and uh, this will eventually warm the atmosphere when it rains. And this is what I was hired to do when I went to South Africa in uh, 92, basically to measure those turbulent heat flux, the net heat budget as a surface of the ocean. And I will show some results because it also has some bearing on the, the story on the warming of the Agulhas current. This is Cape Town here. Come visit us. It's beautiful. When you go to sea, you have a view on Cape Town that's incredible. And this is the vessel that I was given to, uh, to do uh, my measurement. This is the crew. That was me 15 years ago or 18 years ago. And when I told the oceanographer that I will not stop to do CTD and ocean measurement, I want to go very fast because of those Earth interaction measurement and send meteorological balloons, I say, fine, Mathieu, just go ahead, but not without us. So I took the student of the fourth year here, and uh, it was a lot of fun. So I decided to go across the Agulhas current here that you can see from that satellite image, so a very warm core of the current. Uh, you note here that you need high resolution sea surface temperature to resolve the currents. If you use one degree resolution data that are used to force atmospheric model, you will not get the core of the current. And as, as, as was the measurement were showing that across the current, there was an increase by a factor of five of the latent heat flux and the sensible heat flux, which is evaporation and turbulent mixing. And what we did also was sending radio sound to connect this huge air sea exchange to the atmosphere. Because ultimately, we wanted to know if it was important to the climate of the, at the coast or the climate of southern Africa. So basically, if you want to calculate roughly this phase, the turbulent flux of humidity or the latent heat flux, it's basically the wind speed measured by the difference of specific humidity from the air to the specific humidity at the very, very surface of the ocean. So the stronger the wind, the more evaporation. You know that. The drier the air, the more evaporation. You know that as well. Here, it's a turbulent latent heat flux is about also four or five times stronger than the sensible heat flux. That is due to the difference of temperature and the mixing. And this is the wind stress, basically the square of the wind speed. In the case of the Agulhas current, if you if you neglect that current, that can be two meters per second, you're going to do a big mistake on those uh, products. 
and uh, to that uh, date, none of the product try to include the speed of the Agulhas current. Uh, so we can improve on that. So the radio sound, they were the crucial thing, those meteorological balloons measuring temperature and humidity along the atmosphere. So here we have Port Elizabeth, that's the coast, where you have a, a weather station, and people were sending radio sound. This is the shelf, this is the core of the current, and offshore. Here in red, you have very high specific humidity, 13 gram per cubic meter, per, per kilogram. And basically, you can see the trace of the Agulhas current. So the evaporation is transmitted to the, the marine boundary layer all the way here to about 1,000 meters. Here, the wind was along the coast. Now, what's happening when the wind goes from the ocean to the coast? That all that moisture is brought about to the coast. This result would not, you know, model will, are, are not doing that effect. If it was not for those measurements, we would not have put forward a lot of hypotheses concerning the impact of the Agulhas current on a source of moisture for the all of South Africa and also for extreme weather. It's basically a wall of moisture that is there all the time. In fact, if you look at the satellite image of the Agulhas current, you will see the straight cloud line. And this is during a high pressure system, during fair weather system. You can see it's really following the current. It can only be the current. And then we measure it and quantify what happened during those 10 days. If you look at the coast, this is a picture I take. High pressure system, strong wind, very nice weather, not a cloud. You look at the Agulhas current now, a lot of clouds. And when you are in the Agulhas current, a lot of drizzle. So very strong latent heat flux. What I shown you was for good weather. Now what's happening when you have a big storm like that? Where now nothing prevents this latent heat flux and humidity to go all the way to a few thousand meters, fueling the storms. And this is those measurements that allows us to, to put forward the hypothesis that the Agulhas current moisture is important to the development of tornadoes at the coast and it sometimes can actually fuel some of the storm. And the storm that we, we study was actually a tornado that almost killed President Nelson Mandela. He was visiting Umtata, almost his hometown, at that day with his bodyguard when a tornado started and, and collapsed that building. Unfortunately, the bodyguards were strong and they covered Mandela by, with their corpse and he survived. And we, we, knew, we knew that, we, found, we learned about that months after. But it was, you know, we were so happy because everybody loved Nelson Mandela. So let's go back to the, that was, uh, let's come back to the, the main story, which is the warming of the Agulhas current, the reason I'm here today. So if you do a trend and you look at the warming of the ocean since the 50s, using sea surface temperature data set that are available from a full big data center, you can see that the whole ocean has warmed up, not evenly, that's interesting, things are not going to be very linear, and there will be some regional differences that we can learn from that. You can see that the Indian Ocean has got a warming of 0.15 per 10 years, that's a lot, that's very warm. And you can see here that the upwelling here has cooled down and the winds are getting stronger, probably because the land is getting warmer. That will increase the pressure gradient between ocean and coast, creating stronger wind and stronger upwelling. Very interesting. And that warming is due to global warming in land. Now, what I see here is the Agulhas current. So when I looked at that for the first time, I, I was telling to myself, well, the, the Indian Ocean has warmed up, so it's quite normal that the Agulhas current has warmed up. Uh, so I did that in, uh, yeah, in 2004. But then I was aware that those SSTs that are used to do those trends, they are reconstructed. There is actually no measurement in 
the South Indian Ocean. So how, did they, how do you get those figures? That's because the paper that describing the data set states that we have filled the gap with statistical technique. Because atmospherician, they cannot you force their model with data, with sea surface temperatures that have gap in them. They need, uh, they need values for the model. So I now started to look at satellite remote sensing and uh, another product called the optimally interpolated sea surface temperature, which use observation and satellite remote sensing. And with almost with 30 years of data, you can do now some serious trends. So what I see here, what I saw here, is a big warming in the Aguilas current system. That data set being optimally interpolated doesn't get the smaller feature. A cooling at the coast and a cooling in that part. We'll come back to that. It's a, it's a very interesting part of the puzzle, that cooling that uh, have happened in 40 to 50 south. Because according to uh, Gilles mentioned the SAM, the south, south, south annular mode, everybody talk about shift of, of westerly. If there was such a thing from 82 to 210 of a shift of westerly, there would be a warming in that place due to less latent heat flux and less mixing. But here there is a cooling, which means the westerly are getting stronger. And here there is an absence of cooling. And as we will see, it corresponds to strong trade wind and strong latent heat flux, strong evaporation. And here it's very, very warm. And the, the Indian Ocean is very warm. So you change the temperature of the ocean, Indian Ocean just a little bit, you're going to change the rainfall on top of it. At the equator, there is a good relationship between sea surface temperature and rainfall. Change the sea surface temperature, you change the rainfall, you change then the Adlai circulation, you change the trade wind, you change the Walker circulation, basically, you, and then by domino effect, you can change the westerly. But let's go back to this warming of the Aguilas current. Now, what puzzled me here is the source of the Aguilas current has warmed less than the Aguilas current itself. And I was now looking at the high resolution sea surface temperature, maybe only 85 to 07, but same pattern. Same pattern, but here I can see a cooling at the coast and a cooling in the upwelling, the dynamic upwelling of Port Alfred, which indicate that the Aguilas current is going faster. And then for me, the Aguilas current is going faster and bring now more warm water in that region. Even I wanted to see some warming here along the Aguilas return current. So it's where I had the first time the idea of an intensification of the current. I didn't think about the leakage yet. And then I talked to my colleague, Pierre Penven, from the IRD that was working with us. The IRD is the only body that sent people for up to four years in a foreign country to help the local people. Okay, but before I will talk about Pierre Penven, because it took him two years to actually look at his model when I show him these results, it's always interesting. Even friends and colleagues, sometimes they have other things important, more important to do. Basically, after I did that trend in sea surface temperature, this is from the paper from Penven, with Penven and Paul. Basically, I looked at the trend in latent heat flux. And I could see a very strong positive trend in the latent heat flux, which means that should have cooled the ocean. In, uh, so basically, it was nice to have that graph because the wind could have actually decreased above the Aguilas current, and the latent heat flux would have, would have been smaller, and that could have caused the warming. Although, although I've told you that it's very difficult to cool and warm the Aguilas current, it would have been a possibility. Here, it's typically the increase in sea surface temperature that is creating this very strong latent heat flux. And that was basically the indication that the warming was not locally made by change in wind speed or latent heat flux or whatever. It was something else. It was remotely produced. So my friend and colleague, Pierre Penven, had a numerical model of the Aguilas current 
that is uh, the ROMS model, it's a regional model, and that model was forced at the boundary that was at near Madagascar by some renalized, that Marie Raymond mentioned product, uh, renalized uh, ocean uh, simulation, um, soda for the specialist. But basically, you try to reconstruct the ocean of the past. And that soda model was forced by the atmospheric renalysis era 40. That's for the people specializing. They, they will know the consequence of doing that. But basically, the soda model itself was not having the retroflexion of the Agulhas current at the, at the right place. None of the model, Orca or Ophès, you know, they, they, they struggle with the position of the retroflexion. But the ROMS model, which is a regional model, he had it quite nicely. So here, I tell uh, Pierrick, listen, look at my result. Can you see what's happening in your model? And what he sees at 500 meters, looking just at the linear trend of, of temperature, now in the middle of the, of the Agulhas current, is a big increase in the leakage area and a quite a big increase in the Agulhas return current not much along the Agulhas current itself. But here, now, the trend is five times the surface trend. And then, so we were like, oh, we're going to make another movie where the people of New York boil to death. Now, what I told, what he, he did also is to compare observation and his model, which is a very difficult exercise to do, especially for sea surface temperature. And we are starting with yearly mean. Since the time span is about 30 years, we average the data for 30 years. So in blue, we have this OISST that satellite derived. In green, the safe model. And in red, the Adli SST, the one I, I, I criticize. But in the Agulhas current, there were a lot of measurement, even for the last 200 years, because of all the vessels going back and forth there. So at least we have some confidence that there are some measurements. And what strikes us is basically there was a good agreement between the model and the observation. Look at that. Here, the OESST increased with, within two or three years. And the model is following the observation. Now, the model is not forced by the sea surface temperature. It's forced in Madagascar, south of Madagascar, very far from, 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 from there. And then when the sea surface temperature goes down, the sea surface temperature of the model goes down, and so forth. There are some problems. All right, fine. But what we see here is even before the satellite era, the Adli SST is also following the model. So what we see here, that was no warming up to 80, the 80s, and a quite a strong warming from 80s to 2000. It's peaking there. And there is also some decade, some six years, four, five years uh, periodicity in that current. We are busy investigating, but you know, another thing that has got that period is El Nino. So, and now we were incredibly happy because now we don't have an observing system like you guys from the Northern Atlantic. There is actually not many people left only four oceanographers, three climatologists, and two meteorologists that can publish papers. OK, it's not the most important thing in life, but for us, it is. So once you have a model that follows observation, you can now derive quantities that you couldn't without an observing system. So what do we do? Of course, the leakage. What do we do? The transport at Port Elizabeth. So another nice, nice observation here is an increase in eddy kinetic energy from altimetry that is showing also a trend from 93 to 2006. Okay, it's not a long time, but it's, you know, it is his observation. So what else did we do? Now we take the transport, the volume, the flux of, the, of that current, it's their drop, around the Port Elizabeth here. And that's basically the, the blue line. OK, we're quite happy with the transport calculated by that model, 60 to 17 sphere drop. I think that's Harry just saw the figure, the figure 70 sphere drop in his, uh, in his cruise. 
And what you can see here, so you have the transport here, and you have the sea surface temperature average in the Agolas retroflection area. And it seems to us that when the transport increase at Port Elizabeth, now the current is two meters per second, it's very fast, then the temperature in the retroflection area increase. And we didn't know it was actually, so it seems that when the current intensify, so then we say, all right, there is a, a trend, a positive trend in the transport, a positive trend in the sea surface temperature in that area. All right, the current is going faster. Little we know that it was not a non-theory. And our paper got rejected many times because of that. The theory is when the Aguilas current goes slower, the, the leakage goes faster. Ooh. Well. So anyway, they, you know, they, it's, it's looking good. So I, I go further. Basically, we, we, can, we calculated also the transport south of Madagascar and in the Mozambique Channel. So here, the transport in the Mozambique Channel doesn't change much. But the transport in South Madagascar seems to mimic, with a, a year later or six months later, the sea surface temperature in the retroflexion area. For instance, here, increase in transport of Madagascar, increase in temperature. OK, it's, it's, it's all right. It's not too bad. So basically, we say it's, it's not the Mozambique Channel, the source. It's south of Madagascar. We have more uh, an increased flow. And when we calculated the, the wind stress curl, ah, the Aguilas current is part of the subtropical gyre. And the subtropical gyre exists because you have easterly in the Indian Ocean and westerly to the south. The difference between the two is called the wind stress curl. This is what dri uh, is driving those, uh, uh, those currents. And this is a Sverdrup. Uh, this is basically the transport of the Aguilas current using the Sverdrup formula that's 50 years old and not too bad. See an increase. But basically, the increase was due to an increase in the wind stress curl due to a stronger trade wind and uh, an increase wind stress curl. Yeah, OK, I've said it. And it was going from south of Madagascar. Now for the leakage. This is the last figure. Basically, we do a section here, not by a vessel, because we don't have access to a, a, a vessel. Since my last cruise in 95, we, my department never had an access to a dedicated cruise. It's not because something bad happened during that cruise. It's because the situation economic was not too good. But now let's look at a trend in temperature along that line. It seems that the temperature depth here from 0 to 1,500 meter, from 35 to 40 south along that line. Here, it's, and here you have the mean, we have the mean uh, model uh, sea surface temperature, basically a very strong increase in a depth of up to uh, two degrees per decade. And an increase in salinity as well from that model. That's, that was very quickly done with the model in MATLAB. And if you plot a time series of uh, the volume flux of that leakage that, uh, along that diagonal line, the transport going into the Atlantic, a very strong increase from about 8 sverdrop here to 14 sverdrop here, an increase in the heat flux as well, a doubling of the heat flux, and also a doubling of the salt, the flux of salt. And the conclusion of the paper is that could have some consequences. But uh, our model was the original model, so it was limited. So here, it's basically the trend in wind speed using this renalized product. It's basically, what is a renalized product? It's a weather forecast that you do retrospect, uh, retrospect, uh, ret in the past, <laughs> every day. So basically, you have the brand new uh, forecast system, and you are using the observation from the past. That's very important to basically do your weather forecast every day, and then you do monthly mean, and those are the, re the re analysis. Of course, in the Southern Ocean, where you have no observation, it's, you know, it can be a bit dodgy. But here, you know, the westerly 
here, you don't really see an increase in westerly. Here you have a decrease, here you have an increase, here you have a decrease. It's more clear in the trade wind area. And if you look at different products, you will, have, you will find different results. It's a difficulty of looking at trend at the regional scale. It's a difficulty to do a forecast or, or, or scenario at the regional scale. It's also difficult to look at trend in climate at the regional scale. Here, the strong wind, so in arrow, you have the mean wind speed, so you know where you are, a trade wind, westerly, and in color, just the trends in meter per second. So here, a very stronger, here also, it has changed. A very strong uh, southeasterly wind that explain why we have more upwelling here. But that could also have changed the whole circulation here. But we were just focusing here. And why do we have an increase in uh, the easterly? It's because we have an increase in rainfall. This is a, a, another product, a new product, the latest version of satellite remote sensing estimate of rainfall. Uh, since 79, it's possible to estimate rainfall. And we have a very strong increase in rainfall in the Indian Ocean. And uh, a very strong decrease above the continent. That, is, that could be due to this Walker circulation. More, advic more convection here and less here. There is a bit more here. That could be more storm, but can we rely on those products further south? But this is quite a big signal. It's getting drier here, where we had stronger trade wind. The pressure is also stronger here and lower here if you look at it. So we, we have some explanation. And I think part of the warming in the Indian Ocean is actually anthropogenic. Part is natural. So it's quite interesting because increase in sea surface temperature in the Indian Ocean, one of the strongest rates worldwide, increase in rainfall on top of it, then increase in the trade wind, the Adley circulation, or just the pressure gradient between Equator and, and the south, and then increase of the all subtropical gyre of the Agolas current, warming of the Agolas current, and, and we'll talk what's happening for later for you guys. So the problem with the Renalysis project is the westerly increase is not straightforward. And everybody talk about shift of westerly. It may be the case worldwide. It may be the case when you look at from the 50s to 2000. But even Gilles uh, index of the SAM was not changing, not showing any much change when looking at the 90s to now. So it may be that that shift of westerly was linked to the ozone layer. The ozone layer, when there is less ozone layer, the Antarctic is cooler at the stratosphere. It's very close to the troposphere. So the whole troposphere gets cooler. And then the, the difference of temperature between the Antarctic and the rest of the world is changing, which leads to the storm track to shift further south. This is what the Antarctic oscillation is, or the, sanu the south annular mode is. So, Increase wind stress curl, increase Agulas current transport. It's a new theory. Increase Agulas current, increase Agulas leakage. New theory. No, this one is not a new theory, just from the Sverdra, but this one was a new theory. For instance, Van Sebil say a weaker Agulas current leads to more Agulas leakage. Now, this led our paper, and the one from Arne is leading to a very interesting debate. I think Arne also in his paper was claiming that the Agolas current is going uh, slower and there is more leakage. In fact, it's all coming from De Reuter's theory, paper in 86 from Model, that basically says that a weaker Agolas current leads to more uh, leakage. But there is a good reason for that, and I think Arne will talk about it. And uh, so it, it, you know, it could still be true. I'm a bit rough on them, but it's because my paper was rejected so much that now I'm. I want to go at those guys. OK, so on. Now I'm going to start a, a debate. Now the observationists are delighted because model and observations, although we agree there is more leakage, some people say it's because the current goes faster, some the current goes slower. The observationists are delighted. They will find funding now to put some equipment to find out what's happening. So here, 
I think ARN is a polar shift of the zero wind stress curve, leading basically to more space for the Agulhas retroflexion to occur and more, uh, and more uh, leakage. So that's, uh, I think that's quite solid. But then also it's written in your paper on that the Agulhas current is uh, reduced. It doesn't follow the Sladrup relationship, and, uh, but we agree on that point. So I knew Arne was talking after me. Uh, it's why I'm so, uh, but I'm sure he's got a, a good answer that they send me back to where I belong. So yeah, basically. Now I, I want to show some new result that seems also to, uh, you know, to, to give some more ammunition that a lot of things are coming from the, from the north, from this increase in trade wind. Basically, if you do the, a trend in the mean kinetic energy and the eddy kinetic energy uh, from uh, altimetry, you can see here that there is north and south of Madagascar. There is also there is an increase in the mean kinetic energy and an increase in kinetic energy. This di the difference here is basically this is linked to eddies. So there is more eddy activity here. And uh, basically, that box also shows a trend, an increase in eddy kinetic energy that is linked to that one. So basically, here, ERA interim, it's a, a reanalysis, it's the latest, one of the latest ones, show an increase in westerly wind here, in red, the increase, and in red, in arrow, the direction of the, of the increase. Increase of westerly, I must admit, it's the only product that's showing that uh, increase so nicely and an increase in trade wind. So basically, if you calculate uh, the transport using the Svalre relationship, you will find an intensification of the gyre. And this seems to be also, uh, if you do the trend in sea level height in the region, and I remove here, like Kaznav and uh, Lowell did very nicely, it was interesting, they remove the mean sea level, uh, that's three millimeters per year. You can see here that if you remove that, there is quite a big difference between the two, but here, this also suggests, this increase of sea level height here, also suggests an intensification of the, the subtropical gyre. That paper is now, after being rejected twice because of the story of the westerly, uh, is now almost accepted with minor revision. And if you look at the sea surface temperature trend from 92 to 2010, we have the same kind of pattern here with a cooling that is collocated with the increase in westerly. Uh, there is no cooling on the Agulhas current because I told you the Agulhas is forcing the atmosphere. It's very difficult to cool the current and uh, still a bit uh, less cooling in that pl place where the trade wind is stronger. This is the end of the talk. I'd like to thank you for your uh, patience, and I want to invite you to Cape Town, where we have time to, uh, and we need you guys to, to help us. And uh, then we will not go to, the, to swim there. You know? we'll, we'll take a boat and swim in that place. Thank you. <laughs>